The Bible is replete with stories of people summoned by God to be leaders. David, King Solomon, and Queen Esther come to mind, but is the Holy Spirit calling you to a place of leadership? Tom Harper, the author of Leading from the Lion's Den, says there are 66 biblical principles that can transform Christians into effective leaders. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. On Harvest. When you, you know, I read the title of your book, Leading from the Lion's Den. So let's just start with that right there. How'd you come up with this title? Well, the Lion's Den, the first thing people think of when they hear Lion's Den is Daniel. Daniel was put in there as punishment for disobeying King Darius's edict to worship only him as God. So the, the cool thing about Daniel is when, even though he knew he was going into the lion's den, he decided he was not gonna change who he was or forsake his beliefs or forsake God. So while he was in there, God preserved him and saved him, but not just so he could save Daniel's life, but so that God could be glorified. So when he came out, the king raised Daniel up in his stature and declared God to be the official God of the land. Um, here at Harvest, we sometimes have the unfortunate task of reporting, reporting on Christians who are leaders who have fallen. And yeah. so we see a crisis in leadership in America today. Can mm -hmm. you speak to that? Sure. Uh, the Bible is really the instruction manual to bulletproof your leadership. Now, just because you're bulletproof doesn't mean you're not going to get shot at. Hence, lions. We're all going to be attacked, criticized. People are going to try to take us down, and sometimes the criticisms are unfounded. But if, if leaders would just look to the Bible for those principles of, of leadership in all situations, it would save them a lot of grief. What's special about the Bible versus all the other books on leadership that are out there? That's a great question because there are a lot of them. Uh, I used to read John Maxwell uh, and Ken Blanchard before I was a Christian. And I didn't know that they were believers until much later, but when I went back to their books and, and realized uh, what their foundation was based on, I realized that they had biblical undertones that were just below the surface. So what I wanted to do is, is do another leadership book, but bring those undertones to the surface right. so that the Bible would not be hidden. Uh, it wouldn't be kind of put under the rug to draw people in. Uh, but I, you know, I, I like using the Bible as a practical how-to manual, even, even if you're not a Christian. Uh, it has some practical wisdom all throughout. Well, I know that you, you have used the Bible, but you also have your own practical experience. Tell us about your sure. background. You said it took you three years to, to write this book? Yes, uh, the, the process of writing the book was an adventure and it was a Bible study. And basically I, I, I sat down and started with Genesis 1-1 and my, my goal was to take one principle from every book of the Bible. Thus, the 66. The 66. Okay. Now, there are many more than 66. Uh, and, and so the hard part was kind of winnowing it down to just 66, but the editor said it has to be one per book of the Bible. And so what I did is I took a, a principle and married it with some modern research and personal experience, and, and, but I had to keep it down to like about a two and a half page chapter. So my personal experience includes a lot of business leadership. Um, my my dream has been to take my business experience and move it into the church world to benefit the church directly. And as I've tried to do that, God keeps pulling me back into the business world. And so I've taken that as a cue to take the biblical principles of leadership and pull them back with me into the business world. As, as you were looking at these concepts and examining the Bible and then taking your own business leadership, were you surprised at some of the things you found? And, and did you maybe say to yourself, I haven't been doing this mm -hmm. quite the right way. Yes, uh, almost every chapter was, there was an, a revelation like that. Uh, as an example, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, when I studied that, that concept of, of the model of how God created and applied that to creativity, because we're created in God's image and we right. have a, just a little spark of, of creativity in us. And what God did is he created the world without any help. He didn't create man and then ask man what we wanted in this world. Right. And so when you take that model and you apply it to the business world or to churches or to any kind of situation where you're leading and you realize rather than having a brainstorming session where I bring everybody in to throw their ideas out, let's let people think on their own first, bring their best thinking to the group and that will prevent something called social loafing. 
and that's some of the modern research that I found. And social loafing in a nutshell is when people are in a brainstorming session, they tend to pull back and let the more dominant ones speak. Mm -hmm. And you're, wait, you're waiting for everybody else to kind of put in their input yes. and then see if you're in agreement. Yes, and then, and then it, it's often too late for the quiet people to put forth their ideas, which might be even better than right. the louder people. Well, Tom, let's talk about some of the principles. Like, say, for instance, do you remember what principle you grabbed out of the book of Job? Job, that was a difficult one, but <laughs> it was a long one. Yes. And with that one, the basic principle was to not be afraid to reach out your hand for help. Too many leaders are, are proud. You know, they, when you, you asked me earlier about leaders who have fallen. Yes. Well, on the way down, they're not asking for help a lot of times because of pride, because of the image they have to upkeep. And when they are in those situations where they're starting to fall, as Job, we just need to reach out for help. And when he said, um, I came into this world basically with nothing and I'll leave it with nothing, uh, you know, he, he, he knows he's going to leave this world without any of his possessions, without anything that he owns. And he's depressed. And his friends come around him and try to tell him, well, it's your sin. You're the reason that you're in this situation. And it depresses him even more. So when, when God comes back in, at the end and he mm -hmm. says, uh, you friends are not true friends of Job. And it is just my pleasure to take you through this, Job. And you just need to reach out to me. Well, we're going to come back with you, Tom, and talk some more about leading from the lion's den and those principles. I'd love to find out what principle you gauged, you gleaned from Ecclesiastes or another book of the Bible. We'll return in a moment. Well, we're back with Tom R. Harper. He's the um, author of Leading from the Lion's Den, and the subtitle says Leadership Principles from Every Book of the Bible. So just as a recap, you have taken 66 principles mm -hmm. um, from the Bible, and you've applied them to leadership. Um, right. Now, we talked before the break about Job, the principle that you gleaned from Job, but you also said there's some really interesting um, principles from, like, Song of Solomon. Yes, that book you, you wouldn't normally associate with leadership. It's mm -hmm. more about uh, love, romantic mm -hmm. love. It's a model of love between the church and Christ. Now, there's one part in it that, that caught my eye, and it talks about uh, letting love happen and not forcing it. And I applied that to loving your work. You know, if, if love can be applied to people, uh, we certainly try to apply it to our work. You know, we say, I don't love my job anymore. Well, the, the key to, to loving your work is to let it happen on its own and have patience. So rather than trying to love your work or being dissatisfied or leaving your job because you don't love it, you need to tarry uh, like, like the, the lovers did in, mm -hmm. in, in this book of Song of Songs. Uh, the, the bride had her friends around her and they asked her what, what's the secret to love and she said it was to wait for love and not to force it. When we, when we look at leadership, I think a lot of the discussion we've had so far has maybe been focused on business leadership. Mm -hmm. But clearly there are leadership positions in other ways. Business leaders are normally trained to be leaders. You, you come up through the ladder and you climb the ladder. Right. Lots of times church leaders aren't necessarily trained. I, is this book maybe a little more applicable for a church leader sometimes than it is for a business leader? Well, it is in, in the fact that many church leaders are thrown into the lion's den. Yeah. They are really devoid of a lot of leadership training at seminary. They learn church history, uh, they learn maybe counseling and they, they, you know, preaching and, and different things like that. But, but administration and leadership tend to be not taught as much in seminaries. And so, yes, this is a, a good manual uh, because it's based on the Bible and, and it can be used in any situation, church leadership, business leadership, um, families, small groups, large groups of, of any size from large to, to three people. You know, so leadership doesn't really just mean uh, a position in a, in a business or even just the senior pastor in a church. It could be the youth pastor, it could be the music minister, it could be a small group leader, Sunday school teacher. And these principles apply and I've seen them work in all size groups. You, uh, and I don't mean to interrupt here, Valerie, mm -hmm. but you mentioned from a family standpoint, what's mm -hmm. something a parent can take out of this book? 
Well, parents tend to wear many hats. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I found, I had somebody uh, not too long ago at the office say, does it feel sometimes, Tom, like you're parenting a bunch of children? And when I thought about that, I said, you know, sometimes it does feel like that. You know, because at home when the children disobey, I have to uh, bring up the consequences and use biblical principles and not spare my child the rod, you know, and those are the consequences of sin and disobedience. And it should be the same in the workplace. Now, I'm not going to whip out a rod and, you know, and, and use that yeah, in the Most employees aren't going <laughs> to. No. <laughs> That's not, it's not even legal. I mean, you know, so there's <laughs> obvious differences. But the, but the core concept of that is to not allow someone's disobedience to go unchecked. And, and, the, and the Bible even says in Proverbs to not let an angry man uh, go uh, and, and not save an angry man from his anger, but to allow the consequences to occur and let those pull him out of his anger to, so he can see what his anger caused. Now, uh, Chuck just brought up the family and church leadership. What about the person sitting in the pew who has such a false expectation of the pastor or the, the, the person in leadership? Yes. What, can, what can they glean from this book? I mean, because- Good question. You know, we sometimes as members, church members, we create this bubble for our, mm -hmm. our church leaders to live in and it's almost impossible. We put them in the lion's den. Exactly. Well, number one, we need to realize that leaders are in lion's den. Mm -hmm. They are criticized a lot, and a lot of it's behind the scenes. A lot of it is silent criticism, you know, one-on-one -on -one or an email or, or something that comes that no one else knows of, or maybe criticism from a family member or a friend. Uh, they're working too much, you know, and that's, that's a behind-the-scenes criticism. And I, I would say one of the most unknown uh, hardships of leadership is dealing with criticism and pastors especially. So when you're in the pew and you realize that your pastor is trying to lead and trying to, to hide the negative side or, or maybe the depressed side or he's tired or he's been criticized, it's just to show love to that leader and understanding that you're in a lion's den no matter where you lead, no matter who you're leading. And sometimes the lions just swipe at you and just scratch you, sometimes they bite and take a pound of flesh. Uh, but le leadership is really a lot more than just the negative side of being in a lion's den. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we as leaders have to become like lions ourselves, go into the den and pull out our followers and fight off the other lions or tame lions, you know. Um, but but Bible also says that the righteous are as bold as lions. So when I'm sitting in the pew and I'm following my leader, I need to be encouraged that I can be as bold as a lion because I've been made righteous by Jesus. And we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of boldness. And it's that boldness which the word is referring to as righteous people made righteous by Christ. We can be as bold as lions. It's, it's one thing to read the book and be able to recite it back. You know, that's something most students have to do at some point. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to take the principles in here and implement them. How do you see the best way for people to harness what's in here and apply it in their everyday life? Yes, well there's tons to choose from. Right. And my recommendation would be to find one that speaks to where you are as a leader right now. An issue you're dealing with, maybe it's a follower who uh, is not recognizing your authority and finding one of the, the verses in the Bible and the concepts in my book and just applying it and trying it out and, and maybe trying to be humble, trying to be quiet, trying not to let your anger come out and, and give yourselves two weeks and just practice that, that concept and then evaluate at the end of, end of the two weeks, did that work? You know, did it yield some benefits? Did it change me as a person? And then, and then once you have one of the concepts down, it's time to try the next one and to add it to your repertoire. And so you can make this a, a, a lifelong journey uh, before you really know how to navigate the lion's den that we call leadership. Wow, thank you so much, Tom, for uh, sharing your insight. And it's very interesting. That's, I think, what makes the book unique, the fact that there are 66 principles that you've pulled out of um, each chapter of the Bible to, um, to, I guess, to talk about leadership and, and to help view, uh, readers understand the principles mm -hmm. and how to apply them. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us. And if you'd like to get a copy of Leading from the Lion's Den, you can go to churchcentral.com. That's churchcentral.com. And if you can't remember that, you know the drill. Just go right to harvest-tv.com and click on show information in the menu bar to find an easy way back to the website. Thank you so much and Harvest will return in a moment.